Hey, what's up? Can Euler's formula be understood before calculus? Well, I'm gonna give it a try. So e to the i times t equals cosine of t plus i sine of t. This is Euler's formula, and we'll get back to this soon. So here, let's just talk about complex numbers. Every complex number z has a real part x and an imaginary part y, so it would be in the form x plus i times y. And we can think of it kind of like a two-dimensional number, right? x plus i times y is just located in the plane at x comma y. So the complex number would be right here, say. And another way to think about its location is in terms of which direction we're pointing at in the complex plane, which could be specified by an angle, theta and how far away we are from the origin, which is like a radius r. And a really important example of this is the imaginary number itself, which we can think of as the square root of negative 1. So the imaginary number is 0 plus i, so it's located at 0 comma 1 right here. And notice that forms a 90 degree angle with the positive x-axis, so it's length 1, angle 90 degrees, or pi over 2 radians. Uh, now, multiplying two complex numbers is actually really satisfying, so let me show you how it works. Uh, so here I have 1 plus i, and here I have negative 1 plus i. Now, when I multiply two complex numbers, I want to add their angles. So this one has an angle right here of 45 degrees, and this one has an angle like this of 135 degrees. So 45 degrees plus 135 degrees is 180 degrees. So that tells me that the resulting uh, number needs to be pointing in that direction. Now, the length of this is square root of 2, and the length of this is square root of 2. So the question is, what should the length of this be? And in that case, we just multiply the length. So root 2 times root 2 equals 2. So we're pointing at 180 degrees from adding the angles at a length of 2, multiplying these magnitudes. And what is this number, by the way? Well, it's located at negative 2 comma 0, so it's just the number negative 2, and all the real numbers are located on the x-axis. Now, multiplying by i is an especially important one to understand. So say I have a complex number z, right? And I want to multiply it by i, which is going to give me iz over here. Uh, how do I know how to multiply by i? What happens when we multiply by i? Well, the length of i is 1, so I'm not going to be changing the length of this. I just multiply its length by 1, which just gives me the same length back. We're not changing lengths when we multiply by i. But we are changing angles, because i has an angle of 90 degrees. So whenever you add by uh, add 90 degrees to an angle, that is a 90 degree counterclockwise rotation. So multiplying by i is just 90 degrees turn counterclockwise from where you were. Let's talk about complex exponentiation. That is when I take e to the power of a complex number. So the way I like to imagine it is picture we have a cannon at the origin. We're going to use the value of y to determine what direction do we want to point the cannon in. And we're going to use the value of x to determine how far we want to shoot the cannonball. So for example, if I want to aim in the 30 degrees direction, then I would want a y value here of pi over 6, because pi over 6 in radians is 30 degrees. Now I'm aiming in the right direction. And say I want to fire the cannon a distance of e to the power of 3. Well then I would choose my x value to be 3, because then I would get right here uh, e to the power of 3. 
So in fact, the choice of X just controls how far we fire. So we can actually take e to the x and kind of just ignore it because it's the simple part. It's really e to the i, y, the aiming and the direction we want to go. That's more interesting for us right now. So let's take a closer look at it then. So here I replaced y with t, but it's the exact same thing. So we have e to the i t equals cosine t plus i sine t, Euler's formula. So e to the i t always has a length of 1. And um, I can't really explain it right now because it's a bit just like a little technical argument, but uh, trust me, it always has a length of 1. So that means if we're always at a length of 1 from the origin, then we fall somewhere on the unit circle. And I like t here to think of it as time. So you start here and you move at a speed of 1, and the circumference of the unit circle is 2 pi, so it would take you 2 pi seconds to make it all the way around. It would take you pi seconds to make it halfway around to right here. And what is that point? That point is negative 1 comma 0. So if I put pi for t, then I would get e to the i pi equals negative 1, which is Euler's identity, which is, you know, uh, very awesome, right? But Euler's formula is even better than Euler's identity because it's telling us the whole infinite picture all at once. So cosine of t, let's choose an example here. So here I chose for t um, 315 degrees to get to here, or 7 pi over 4. So cosine of t is the real part, and it's going to tell me my x value. So you see my x value here is root 2 over 2. And sine of t is my imaginary part, and it's going to tell me my y value. In this case, it's going to be negative root 2 over 2. So you see e to the i t is really just a locator system. You just put in the value of t where you want to be on the unit circle and it puts you there. I have explained what Euler's formula is, but I haven't really explained why it looks the way it does. And that's the tricky thing, because there are so many proofs of it, and then once you prove it, you use it to do more proofs to explain itself. In fact, Euler's formula, to me, is more the explainer than it is the explained. But let me give you one point of view that I think will really kind of put the conspiracy a little bit in your mind to appreciate some of what's going on. So these are differential equations. These are equations that describe changing quantities. So here I have y prime equals y. So these change over time or over space or over something, right? And y you'll think of as the position, and y prime you could think of as velocity, changing position. And y double prime you can think of as acceleration, changing velocity. So y prime equals y says that as my position gets bigger, my velocity gets bigger. Well, that creates a continuous positive feedback because once you get further out, you start going faster. But once you start going faster, you get out further even faster, which means you go faster even faster. Or cycled, cycled, cycled. In fact, e, the number e, 2.718 dot dot dot, is kind of like the continuous version of 2 in a way. If you're just to double over and over again, it would go 1, 2, 4, 8, and so on. But if you get that continuous feedback, same thing as doubling essentially, but you get a little extra because you kind of build up on yourself continuously. Then you get 1 e e squared e cubed, and so on. So e to the t is one of the solutions to this equation. It basically describes explosive growth, positive feedback. Now y prime equals iy says that my velocity is equal to my position 
multiplied by i, and that has as a solution e to the i t. And then I have y double prime equals negative y. This says my acceleration is equal and opposite to my position. And I have cosine t and sine t as some of the solutions to this equation. So let's take a closer look at y prime equals i y. What's going on here? Well, y is my position. So let's say I'm positioned here, right? Well, my velocity is i times y. What's multiplying by i? That's rotating 90 degrees this way. So i y is going to be pointing 90 degrees that way. In fact, it's perpendicular to my position. So what it says is whatever my position is, I'm going to move perpendicular to it. Well, isn't that just the description of circular motion, right? Relative to the origin, I'm always going at a 90 degree angle to my current position. I'm just walking around this circle and that's it. And after two pi seconds, I'll make it all the way around because I'm moving at a speed of one and the circumference is two pi. Okay. So now let's look at y equals negative y double prime. I kind of rearranged it, but really all it just means is that um, position and acceleration are equal and opposite, right? So let's say I start at a position of zero. My position is sort of measured vertically here. So as I go up here, I have a positive position and I'm going positive, positive, positive. Oh wait, but that means my acceleration needs to be pointing down negative because my position is positive. So as I'm going up, my acceleration is pulling me down. It's turning me around until it's pulling me down this way, this way, until I hit a position of zero. Now I'm going into the negative positions. Now I'm negative, but wait, now that my position is negative, my acceleration needs to have the opposite sign. So it's going to be positive acceleration, which is pulling me up. It's pulling me back up all the way back up to here. And the cycle is going to repeat endlessly like this, repeating this segment forever that way and forever backwards in time as well. Uh, so this basically creates a wavy shape, which is the same, sh which is the shape of cosine and sine. Uh, in fact, cosine and sine are just uh, shifted versions of one another. So let's put this all together now. So we have e to the i t. As t increases, we're just traveling perpendicularly. We're traveling around the unit circle. And cosine of t is the real part of this, meaning the real part describes the x value. So my x value, when I start here and start traveling around, is going to go from one to zero to negative one to zero to one all the way over again, uh, cycling, cycling. In fact, my x value is just waving up and down, which this equation describes. So that is how moving around in a unit circle relates to cosine of t. And then what about the y value? Well, my y value is also gonna be waving up and down. And I, and I look at my imaginary part, sine of t, that describes my y value, which also solves this equation, which happens to describe what happens when your acceleration is always equal and opposite to your position. And that's where I'm going to end it. If you have any questions about this, technical or otherwise, feel free to ask me. And I hope you found it interesting. Um, thanks for watching and goodbye.